Well, a young man showed up to work one day and he had big bandages on both ears. And his co-worker said, what in the world happened to you with those bandages on both your ears? He said, well, I was ironing my clothes and the phone rang and I actually picked up the iron instead. So that explains that ear. What about this one? Said they called back. That pretty much summates what a lot of Christians do, a lot of lost people do. We keep doing the same thing, looking for different results. But every time you pick up that iron and answer, it's going to burn your ear. And every time you do anything contrary to the Word of God, it's always going to turn out bad. It always does. Why? Because the Word of God is true every time that we, uh, that we read it and study it. It's true no matter what. This morning, it's the same is true with the children of Israel. We're going to look at the end of the story before we look at the beginning of the story. And that's in Numbers 11 when the children of Israel refused to be satisfied with manna and God gave them meat. It said, The wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a great plague, and he called the name of that place Kerbroth Atava because they buried the people who had yielded to cravings. That word kabroth hatava is two words. Graves is kabroth. Hatava means your lust or greeds or desires or wants or wishes. And so what God did there, he named that place the graves of desires because that's where the people and their desires got buried. Not all the people died, obviously, but it was a place that he wanted named Graves of desires so that whoever passed that way or whoever visited that city in the future would say that's where God's people's wrong desires got buried. You say, Brother Tim, is it wrong to have desires or wants or wishes? I mean, is that just so bad that God would kill these people over just having desires? No. Psalms 37, 4 says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, what does that mean? If I delight myself in the Lord, I can desire a BMW? (laughs) No, it means if I delight myself in the Lord, he'll give me the desires he wants me to have, and then fulfill those desires. Does that verse make a little more sense now instead of, okay, I delight, now here's what I want. Wave your wand, God, and give me what I want. No, I'll delight myself in the Lord. And by delighting myself in the Lord, the Lord says, here, I'm going to give you these kind of desires because you're delighting in me. And then I'm going to fulfill the desires that I give you so that you'll be a fulfilled person. Who in here doesn't want to be a fulfilled person? Well, you won't be if you have your own desires and try to fulfill those. But if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you a desire and then he'll fulfill it. So it's not wrong to have desires They had desires that weren't of God. They had fleshly desires, selfish desires, uh, desires that only they had and not God. This place had a name change. Name changes are important for us to take note that God said, I don't want this to ever be taken away, that forever I want people to know that I do bury desires. I do have a place that will be a graveyard of desires. And we're going to see if God was so diligent about that, we sure don't want to end up there. And so I guess the question is, are you or am I on the road to Kabrathatava? I don't want to go down a road that's going to get me to this city to where God says, when you get to the end of this road with the decisions you're making, with your own desires, your own seeking what you want, you're going to find that you're going to end up at a place where I'm going to bury those desires. I don't know about you, I can reflect back on some things where I got what I wanted and that wasn't what I wanted. (laughs) I thought I wanted it, but God buried it. And I believe it's all important to say if this is where the children of Israel, God's people, ended up after leaving Egypt, then I don't want to go there. And you may be asking, Brother Tim, can you... Tell me how to get there so that I know how to avoid getting there. 
Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to give you some road signs to find out how to get to this place so that you and I don't get there. Now, I didn't say, are you in Habroth Katava? I said, you're on the road there. You know, you could be on the road to Dallas and only at Huntsville. <laughs> but you're still on the road to Dallas. You just hadn't got there yet. You're on your way. I don't even want to be on my way to this place because I don't want God to kill my desires. I'd rather have his desires and then have those fulfilled. So let's start on this one. Number one, it's the detour sign. Once you're heading toward the way of Christ, then you decide, ah, I think I'll detour for a little bit and detour toward discontentment for God's ways and God's provision. It says there in Numbers 11.1, 1, now when the people, and this is where it always starts, discontentment, complained, it displeased the Lord for the Lord heard it and his anger was aroused so that the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Later on, we're going to see what they complained about was the food. They wanted meat instead of manna. But here, it's not clear in this passage exactly what they were complaining about. Of course, it spills over in a few more verses that they're complaining about the food God provided. But either way, they're complaining about something and God's not pleased and God brings out the blowtorch and starts burning them up. Praise God that Moses gave his fire extinguisher prayer and had God cease the fire torture and it was stopped. But God was upset because these people were complaining. Now, what they were complaining about was they were discontent, whatever the complaint was. And a lot of us can become discontent with, with God and His ways or His provision or what you would say His lack of provision. Is God providing what I need? You know, it was, uh, you know, many times we, we tend to forget our blessings, but we sometimes find fault in His provision. I think it was Spurgeon that said, people write their trials down in marble but their blessings they write in the sand. <laughs> Easily blown away when the wind comes. We forget about what God's done, but boy, we sure can remember all of our trials and troubles and heartaches. A man took a tour through Mexico and he was amazed to see at one site where the women were out washing clothes in the river and on this side of the water, there was a, two springs and this spring was a hot spring. On this side, just on the other side of the rocks was a cold spring. And what the women were doing, they were washing their clothes outside in the hot springs and rinsing them over here in the cold springs, side by side. And the tourists began to ask a man next to him, said, man, this is amazing. Your women here, God's provided hot water right here next to cold water for your women to wash their clothes free of charge. They must surely be grateful to God. And the man talking to him said, no, senor. There is much grumbling because he provides no soap. <laughs> you see, we always want more. We, we, we're easily discontented with what there is in life. No matter who we are, we just, we have this fleshly desire to want more. You know, you can mark it down. The person who finds fault rarely finds anything else in life because that's not what our focus needs to be on. Our focus needs to be on praising God for his provision and all that he does and not all that he should do. And so whatever this complaint was, God wasn't pleased. If you think he was, then read there. It says it displeased the Lord that they weren't content. Was it 1 Timothy 6.6 6 that says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. And Lord, can I be content with your provision? Can I be content with doing things your way and not my way? That's where a lot of our temptations are. Well, Christianity is kind of boring and, and it leads us down the wrong way. We think that there's something more to life and we become discontent. The second road sign to get to Cabrotha Tava is to yield to your own desires before God's desires. It's not wrong to have desires. It's wrong to have desires that are before God's desires. That's what we need to be focused in on. In Numbers 11.4, it says, And the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving, so that the children of Israel also wept again and said, 
who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. So you say, well, who are these mixed multitudes? Those are some of the Egyptians that left with the children of Israel. In other words, when the children of Israel finally left Egypt, some Egyptians said, we're going to go with you. They may have seen all these great miracles that their God did and said, hey, we're going to head out. Not that they were converted, but they said, we're just going to leave too. So they got a little discontent. And of course, the children of Israel got content with them. Always make sure who you hang out with. Make sure you don't have a mixed multitude. Yes, witness to people. Yes, try to lead them to the Lord. But if you're letting them lead you, they're the ones that kind of said, are y'all happy with just this provision? Manna. Remember, God was bringing manna to them to eat every day. But they begin to complain like, we don't want manna anymore. We want some meat. Just some meat around here. All God throws out at us is just this manna. We need to have, and it, look what they did. They yielded to intense cravings. We just, we got to have something more. And then the children of Israel said, well, we ate real good back in Egypt. Cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. We ate good back there. How quick we forget. Yeah, you remember the cucumbers, but you forget the chains. You remember the melons, but you forgot the masters who used to beat you and whip you and torture you. Yeah, you, you remember the onions, but you, know, you forgot about all the hardship. You remembered the, the, the garlic, but you forgot about the guard's whip. You remember that? 400 years of slavery, and all you can think about is garlic, cucumbers, leeks, onions. But that's what it is on this world's attraction. That's how dumb it is. When we get attracted to the world, here they're enjoying freedom with manna, but they'd had, rather have go back to Egypt with slavery. Do you know none of these five vegetables are ever listed as any blessing in the promised land when they finally made it there? You can't find those five vegetables anywhere. It's almost like God said, you wanted it so bad to go back to Egypt, I'm not even going to provide that in the promised land. Of course, it did have milk and honey, which I've got to like some milk and honey better than I do those vegetables anyway. But anyway, <laughs> God said, I'm not even going to bless you with that anymore. And none, none of those are listed. Gosh, can you believe? And you think, well, that's so silly to want what to go back to Egypt. Listen, they were out of Egypt, but Egypt wasn't out of them. See, some people are out of the world, but the world's not out of them. They still want what the world has and do what the world does and make money like the world makes and be able to enjoy things that the world does. And God said, come out of the world, come out of Egypt. And they're out of Egypt, but they say they still want to go back to Egypt. We still want what Egypt had. Boy, you're on the road to Gabrath Taba there. It ain't going to be long. You're going to end up there quickly when you start yielding to your own desires other than God. Now, look how... Minor, that seems. You say, I'm not committing adultery or robbery or I'm not doing all those quote-unquote big sins. I'm not going to end up in a bad place. All they did was yield to their own cravings. There's some things I really want. But God didn't want them to have it. And you have to realize how good this was. Remember, all you had to do was go out each day and God rained down manna from heaven. And all you had to do was pick it up freely you couldn't get more than one day's supply because the next day's supply would go rotten. But when it came down to the Sabbath, the day before the Sabbath, you could pick up two days and that manna would last two days because the next day was the Sabbath. And the next week started the same way. Free food every day. Now, how would you complain if HEB came to your door and said, we're going to bring food here free every day. We're going to deliver it to you and put it on your doorstep every day. No, y'all don't handle the brand milk I like. So no, that's what these people are doing. God's giving them free food. He's delivering it to them every day like clockwork and they want to complain. Say, well, we'd rather not have this. We want something else. You see, substitutes can be killers. There's, the devil will always want you to substitute. Everything that the devil does is a substitute. 
Everything he has for us is a substitute for what God really wants to have for us, but he'll substitute. In other words, people say, well, does God don't want me to have a relationship? Yeah, but with a believer, well, I'll have a relationship, but just I'm going to marry an unbeliever. Uh, God doesn't he want me to work? Yeah, but he wants you to work where he leads you to work. Uh, what does he want me to do here? Whatever he leads you to do or whatever his word says to do. But if you do what you want to do, apart from what he wants you to do, you'll always lead to a substitute. That won't be a blessing. See, we substitute all the time, and the modern church today is the master at substitutes. We've substituted doctrine for entertainment. We've substituted water down for the real word. We've done all these substitutes, and it's come into now our lives where we substitute the real for the fake. And we buy into it. Look, God may provide what you want and desire later, but don't get it until he, it's time for you to get it. I watched a documentary on 2020 or one of these shows years and years ago, and they were just showing the effects that people can have with their mind on something. And they went into this like college bar where college kids hung out and they told the owner somehow, it was years and years ago, maybe 15 years ago when I watched this, and they were saying like, substitute all their alcoholic drinks today with non-alcoholic drinks at that table right there. And we've set up hidden cameras and we're going to video this. You know, whatever drink they have, give them that drink and we're provide, I think they provided them, said these are the non-alcoholic drinks of all that. And so there they were at the table. And, oh, buddy, woo, oh, I got that buzz going on, man, it's, Man, you feel, man, I'm about as drunk as skunk. Man, I don't know what's going on. And they were ripping, rowling, and stumbling, and falling down, and all kind of stuff. And so they brought the cameras up to them. And they said, you know, how are you guys doing? Oh, man, we, we're just drunk, having a great time. It's just got a buzz and all that. They said, you realize you haven't had one drop of alcohol? Oh, yeah, we have. Look at all this. No, it's non-alcoholic. Really? Really? Those drunks learned something that a lot of Christians don't do. They were calling what wasn't so, so. See, I can call what's not so, so by faith and say, I'm going to believe God's doing this for a blessing and I'm going to call it so. They were saying, I'm going to call it so, so already, even though there's no so in this alcohol. There's no alcohol in the drink. And so they were out acting drunk when there was no reason to be drunk. They, they put so much faith in the alcohol, they were even acting drunk. <laughs> when there was nothing there to make them drunk. Because they believed it could do it. Even when it wasn't doing it. You say, I don't have enough faith. Well, they had a lot of faith. They were walking in drunkenness with no reason and provision to be drunk. See, I can't be happy with God's provision. <laughs> Tell them that. They were happy with no provision just because they had faith in something like alcohol to alter their behavior. So we can do it. We can be happy with manna. We can be happy with God's provision or way of doing things or being obedient to his word. The next thing is to exit, to spicing up your life. One thing the devil always hits you with is, man, you're kind of bored here. This church... Christianity, prayer, Bible study. Is that all? That's pretty poor existence. You need to spice up your life. What, they're, what the devil's saying is, oh, you got some manna. Now, our whole being, they said, is, is dried up. There's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. That's, you know, you ever had people say, I'm about to die of thirst. I'm about to die of hunger. I mean, that's just exaggeration for most people, you know. But here it's saying our whole being's dried up. We got nothing in life. Why? Because all we've got is manna. All we have is God's provision. And that's not enough. We got to have more in life than just boring, boring manna. You know what they were really saying symbolically, what we say today? It's clear in the New Testament what the manna represented. Is it not Moses who had given you bread from heaven? That's the manna. But 
it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. So what was the manna? Jesus. That's what the New Testament says, that that manna was Jesus. Why? Because it came down from heaven and met their need. And now we have manna coming from heaven, Jesus. And so really what they were saying symbolically is, I need more than Jesus. <laughs> is this all you got for us is Jesus? You know, we need more. We need better provision. And you know, if you read Exodus 16, 4, it says that the manna was given for a reason. You know what it was? A test. Read Exodus 16, 4. It was a test. It was a test for them to see if they would be content with doing things God's way. And if they had a teacher grade and they'd have put a big old F right there, you failed. I gave you the manna to see what you would do and you, you wanted something more. You failed the test. So if there's any temptation you have to say there's more to life than what I can find in Christ, the world's got a little bit better to offer, then you're exiting to spice up your life in a way that's not going to spice it up. And now you're getting real close to Kabratha Tava You've already detoured and yielded and exited. You're right on the exit ramp to get to that city. That's how these people got there. And what's the next one? All you got to do now is enter the apparent satisfaction of doing it your way. It seems to be going good, Brother Tim. You can preach all you want to preach, but I'm heading down this road doing what I want, doing it my way. I know what the Bible says, but I'm not doing it with all those fanatics that obey every word. Listen, this is the Lord who's speaking to Moses. Then you shall say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. You shall eat meat. Oh, that sounded good. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, you will give us meat to eat. For it was well with us in Egypt. Can you believe they were saying that? It was well for us back there. You were in slavery. You were making bricks and in, in bondage. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor 10 days, nor 20 days. Wow. I'm going to get to eat a lot of days. Well, he's not through. But a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils. I don't know if you've ever thrown up, but I won't go over there. Anyway, <laughs> lunch will be here in a minute. But, and, because, and becomes loathsome to you because you've despised the Lord who's among you and have wept before him saying, why did we ever come up out of Egypt? So they're thinking, well, I do get satisfied. This all worked out right. I wanted meat, and I'm going to get meat. See, Brother Tim, having my own fleshly desires is okay because everything's coming my way. That's what you do when you go to a broth atop and you make that exit. Then you enter apparent satisfaction, so you stay there. That's what gets you to Kabratha Tava is you find out this apparently works. You see, everybody wouldn't get to Kabratha Tava if it didn't look like it was going to be apparently good. And so what do they get? Well, they get what they want. Isn't that a good thing? To get what you want? That's what you've always desired was meat. And now you got so much. So what is, how does God give them, give them the meat? Well, what he does is he sends a wind from the southeast. And in that wind, he blows in quail. You say, well, why is the southeast important? Because quail, even to this day, don't fly in from the southeast in that part of the country. They fly in from the northeast. And I believe God sent them from the southeast to say, don't think these birds were just flying around thinking, I think we'll kind of little nose dive down there in Israel. No, he wanted them to know this was me that sent it because quails don't go in that direction anyway. They come in the opposite direction. So he brings this southwesterly, southeasterly wind and he blows these quail in. And the scriptures indicate that the, he sent them in two cubics high. That's about four, right at three to four feet. And based on the height of people during that time that were around five foot tall or less, that was right there at arm's length. So imagine these quail by the millions probably 
coming in from the southeast exactly four to five foot high. God kept them in this range. They didn't even have to bend down to get one and they didn't even have to reach up to get one. They just grabbed them like this. Just pick them because they're just right at arm level. God made it so easy to bring that meat and just pick as much meat as you want as he brought them in that high. And the people stayed up all night and all that day and gathered quail. And he who gathered least gathered ten homers and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. We'll say, how much is ten homers? Well, ten homers is 60 to 70 bushels. You know what a bushel basket looks like? A bushel basket will hold about eight gallons of liquid if it was liquid. And the guy that got, or the lady that got, or the teenager that got the least that day got 60 to 70 bushels of them. Now, how much did the guy get that got the most? Man, I don't know, but that's a lot of quail in one day. 60 to 70 bushels to the least guy. Oh, man, I'm getting what I want. Woo, I'm getting what I want. See, so you're getting what you want will probably happen. But it isn't what we want to happen. Because, listen, look at what Jeremiah, how he said it, how, how the people said it to him. As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you, but we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth. In other words, we tried doing it your way is what they were telling Jeremiah. We did stay away from sinning, but we're not going to stay away from that sinning anymore. We're going to do what comes out of our mouth now. Because let, let me tell you, Jeremiah, they're going to tell him, let, let me tell you what happened when we were doing what you said. For back then, we had plenty of food and were well off and saw no trouble. Back when we were sinning and doing evil and burning incense to the queen of, of heaven, an idol. Now mark this down. Don't think because nothing bad's happened to you so far that you're doing God's will. Okay? A lot of people say, well, if it was so wrong, God would have already done something to me. So I must be doing something right because nothing bad's happening. That doesn't, that's what they were saying. Back when we were doing evil, we had plenty of food. We were well off and we saw no trouble. But now that we've done what you've done, since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and poured out our drink offerings to her, we've lacked everything and we've been consumed by the sword and by famine. That's what a lot of people do. They said, you know what? I've been backslidden for a long time and it ain't been that bad yet. <laughs> you see, that was their excuse. That, that's no way to judge your spirituality was, well, this looked a little better and this looked... Yes, God blesses and God does chasten, but it just may not have happened yet. And it didn't happen till later on these people either. God does chasten his people. And then the last thing, we stop to get the reward for your labor. Stop to get the reward for your labor. But while... The meat was still between their teeth before it was chewed. The wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people and the Lord struck the people with a great plague. Ooh, this is good. Ooh, this is good. Give me another quail. And then it happened. While they were still chewing it, God struck them with a plague. Because God wanted it to be known from there on out that every time papal passed Kabratha Tava, they'd say, we might not ever desire what God doesn't want us to desire. Because that's the place that the people were struck down for their cravings. And that's why it's called children. I'm sure they told their children and grandchildren. That's why that place is called the graves of desires. See, God wanted a memorial to be able to teach all people from all times what God thinks about our desires being 
ahead of his. I like what Warren Wiersbe said, sometime God's greatest judgment is to give us what we want. I can look back on my life and say, God, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And God gave it to me. I wish he wouldn't have. <laughs> can you go back to your life and say, I can point the finger. God said, don't do that. And you did it and you're paying for it to this day. Don't do that and you're doing it and you're paying for it to this day. Don't go there and you're paying for it to this day. And God's a God of grace and he forgives, but we see what we did was what we wanted and God gave us what we wanted and that's what he used to judge us for what we did. Yes, God judged Christ for all of our sins for us to get to heaven, but there are some consequences, is what Warren Wiersbe meant by judgment. There are consequences and God does that many times by saying, okay, you didn't do what I want. Now the very thing you wanted will be what brings you the chastening. Don't ever want what you want apart from what God wants. It never brings anything except trouble. You see, even the psalmist repeated this story. So they ate and were well filled, and he gave them their own desire. He said, if that's what you really want, then I'll give you what you really want. That's not what I want you to have, but I'm going to give it to you. And they were not deprived of their craving, but while the food was still in their mouths, the wrath of, wrath of God came against them, and he slew the stoutest of them and struck down the choice men of Israel. And in spite of all this, they still sinned. You'd think, okay, you wanted us to have manna, we wanted meat, you used the meat to judge us, and then they went on, the ones that didn't die with that, went on and still sinned. And then you think, well, then, in verse 35, and then they remembered God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. Well, that was good that they turned around. But nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth and they lied to him with their tongue for their heart was not steadfast with him nor were they faithful in his covenant. You see, they still didn't learn that lesson. See, how many times does God need to send us through things for us to learn, let's do it your way and not our way? But they didn't learn it. They still weren't faithful in what they did. Some made it to the promised land. Well, they were died off. Many died off. Uh, but the blessings of heaven are never found on the road to Gabrathatava. If we have any desire that's not really God's desire, if we're not delighting ourselves in the Lord and Him giving us the desires of our heart, our own desires always bring us down. You know, John Killinger to, retells a story that appeared in the Atlantic Monthly magazine. And he was telling how ranchers used to start breaking wild horses to get them broke before they even, ever, ever got on back of them. And what they'd do, they'd take a big donkey and they would tie it with a rope to one of these broncos. And then they'd let them out the gate to just run out in the wilderness. And boy, they said when they did, boy, that Bronco would be bucking and running and, and just taking that little donkey for a ride. It was just bouncing around like a cream puff, left and right, and just, just going crazy as that Bronco was just taking him for a loop. And so they could see that as far as you could see till the Bronco took him over the horizon. Ranchers said back then that it wouldn't be long. A few days later, They'd be looking over the horizon and they'd always see the same sight. It would always be the little donkey coming first with the big bronco in tow with the donkey in the lead. Here's what Killinger wrote. Somewhere out there on the rim of the world, that wild horse would become exhausted from trying to get rid of that little donkey. And in that moment, the donkey would take mastery and become the leader. See, the only way for that horse to be broken and to say, I'm going to do it the right way was to finally become exhausted doing it their way. The children of Israel didn't do this. They got exhausted, got a plague, but they still went back to doing it the same way. It never changed them. How many times does God have to send his people, and you saw him do that many times in Israel, over and over and over again for them to finally say, we're broken enough to let you in control. 
That's what God's trying to do through all these instances that he did. And who knows that God later on would have not provided them meat. Remember when the first city that the children of Israel destroyed, remember Jericho? He told them, don't take any of the loot. Don't, don't, don't take anything. Destroy it all. Don't, don't take a thing. And remember, remember when Achan took some things and he had to pay with his own life because God gave real strict instructions. Don't take a thing. Now, if they had waited just a little bit, the next city, they got to take some stuff. He was just saying, don't take it now. It's not my will to have it now. But I'll give you some later, just not this city. Who knows if they would have waited. They may have not got quail. They may have got T-bone steak already cooked with, with potatoes and salad and all these rolls and butter and garlic bread. And it would have came down like, who knows if that wouldn't have happened. I'd rather have that than raw quail. I mean, I don't know what God would have done later. But if they'd have just waited and been content with God's ways, then who knows what he would have sent them. It would have been a blessing. But quail was a curse. It became a curse. The thing they wanted became the very thing they didn't want. And we have to be on guard about that and never be on the road to Kabratha Tava. Do you see how these little exits and detours were just little slight variations in what we normally do? It wasn't like... Listen to the devil and go out and devil worship. No, it's just start being a little less discontent with the things of God. Just go over here and detour just a little. We wake up one day and we're booking a hotel in Cabratha Taba. Buying real estate there. Camping out. Say, where am I right now? Here in Cabratha Taba. Nothing else is working at Cabratha Taba. The very things I thought I wanted to bring in Cabratha Taba. It's time to sell and get out of there. Why? Because one last sign I didn't show you. God does U-turns. If you find yourself on the way to Kabratha Tava, in Kabratha Tava, get in the car and head back. Get out of there now. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to make it work. Well, good for you. Let us know how that works next Sunday. Just stay there, camp out, live there. No, get in the car, do a U-turn. God allows U-turns. He's allowed that a lot in my life. Just go back, head back. Go back to where you messed up, which was to detour from being satisfied with the way I say your life should be and doing the things I say you need to do and quit saying, well, it's boring and bland and manna's kind of bland and I need to spice things up. No, 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 no. Just do it my way and watch how I bless you and watch how things go. I don't want to be on the broth of Hatava. I've been looking at my life all week with a microscope after preparing this. I said, Lord, I don't want any desire that I have to bring me down. Amen. And sometimes you feel like, well, he'll give in. He's like a parent, you know. I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. I want it. Well, they did that too, and he went ahead and used that to judge them. Lord, don't use our desires to judge us. What do we say? We say what the psalmist says, I will delight myself in the Lord, and he will give me the desires of my heart, and then he'll fulfill those desires. That's what God wants to do. He wants to bless his people, but wait on his way of doing it. Don't jump out. Don't jump ahead. You say, well, it's not coming, working out how, wait. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Mount up with wings as eagles. You see, God's gonna let you soar, just don't want the quail now. Wait for what he wants and you'll be blessed. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet.